Pasadena. I'm Tom Bray, Senior Editor for the Pasadena Star News and Southern California News Group. The Star News has been proud to cover this very special city since 1884. Welcome to the 2020 mayoral debate hosted by the Star News, the Pasadena Community Coalition, and the Conversation Live. Southern California News Group is pleased to be working with these folks again to put on this event. I don't have to tell you, it's been a year like no other. The nation has grappled with such tests as an international pandemic, a sweeping debate over social justice and the role in law enforcement, and enduring political polarization that has framed a particularly vital election season. Pasadena too has weathered these challenges among others. And as we hopefully move beyond the coronavirus outbreak, there will certainly be more on the horizon. The good news is that the city has two committed candidates eager to take on these challenges in the days ahead. Today, incumbent Mayor, Mary Tor Mayor, Mayor Terry Tornick and his challenger city councilman, Victor Gordo, will be helping voters make their decision by laying out their views on some of the issues the city faces. So with no further ado, I'd like to thank you for joining us for the debate and introduce our moderator from the Pasadena Community Coalition, Martin Gordon. Hello and welcome everyone to the great Pasadena Mayor's Debate. We had a difficult time getting here, but we're here now and we're ready to go. Before we get started, I wanna make a, tell you something from the uh, deep from my heart and from the Pasadena Community Coalition. We'd like, for you, we'd like to acknowledge from the Pasadena Community Coalition that Black Lives Matter. From all of us, we'd like to say, send our sincere condolences for the 200, I'm sorry, the 129 people that have passed due to COVID right here in Pasadena and the over 218,000 that have passed around the country. This is a real disease with real consequences not to be taken lightly. Both of these issues will be addressed in today's debate, but let's move on and meet our candidates and our panel. First, we have longtime council member, Victor Gordo, the challenger. Hi, Victor. And also our current, our, our current mayor, Terry Turner. Afternoon. Let me see if I can switch this. There we go. Our panel who will ask a question today, Bradley Bermont. We're gonna see Bradley. Bradley Bermont, reporter, journalist for the Pasadena Star News and James Farr of The Conversation Live. And of course, our most important person, our timekeeper for today is Caroline Wong, Director of Communications and Custom Content for The Star News. That's a really long title, which means that she makes a whole lot of money, I guess. So thank you for doing that for us today. <laughs> The candidates have been given the rules of engagement, but I will briefly go over them for our viewing audience. Opening statements are two minutes, closing statements, one minute. There will be approximately 10 to 16 questions according to time. Each candidate will have two uninterrupted minutes to answer each question. Then each candidate will have one uninterrupted minute for rebuttal. We will then move to the next question. Once the questioning starts, we will alternate between candidates as first responder to a question. The candidates will be notified off screen with a green card when they have 15 seconds left on their response and then a red card when your time is up. As, mod as moderator, I will let you know when your time is absolutely up. Candidates, are there any questions? Uh -oh. I'm not sure what's happening here. Oh, there I am. You're watching some pictures of my uh, cognac there. Hey, that, you don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, candidates, are there any questions? No, and, and so... Um, all right, we're ready to go. And we will start with you, Councilmember Gordo, and you may make your opening statement. 
Hello, everyone. I'm sitting in front of the PUSD school I attended more than 40 years ago, Madison Elementary. Uh, thank you to everyone who voted for me in the primary. Uh, I was humbled to finish in first place. Pasadena is not home to me. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we're having a problem here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Wait, I'm sorry. I apologize. Not sure what happened here. We can hear you. A, can you hear me okay? You guys yes. just dis disappeared off the screen. Okay. All right. Turn your Turn your microphone back on. Sorry about that. All right. So here we go. Third try. Hello, everyone. I'm sitting in front of the PUSD school uh, that I attended over 40 years ago, uh, Madison Elementary. Uh, thank you, everyone who voted in the primary for me. Uh, I was very humbled to finish in first place. Uh, Pasadena is home to me. I did not move here uh, to conduct an urban planning exercise. I played in the parks, our parks. I attended our schools. I lived in our neighborhoods. I worked in our local businesses as my father did for over 50 years, for 50 years. The job of mayor of the mayor of Pasadena is to have his or her finger on the pulse of every part of our city uh, and represent its residents. I listen and represent residents because I believe in the collective wisdom of, the, of our residents in Pasadena. At the core of this election is representation. Do you feel listened and represented in the last five years? Or do you feel dismissed uh, in favor of the view of our incumbent? I represent people, not projects. I'm the most qualified candidate uh, and most experienced. I worked on the 710 freeway to oppose it before Mayor Tornick arrived. I worked to say no to the NFL before Tornick, Ter Terry Tornick arrived. I worked on inclusionary housing before Terry Tornick arrived. I worked on the strength to strengthen that's, these finances. Long that's, before. Time. that's time, Mr. Gordo. Thank you. Mr. Tornick, your opening statement. Good afternoon, and thank you to the sponsors for being so persistent. Uh, I <laughs> hope that the organizers that uh, were ill are recovering. And thanks to the viewers for taking time, particularly those of you who are watching uh, in competition with the Dodger game. Um, my campaign has focused on defining the issues that face our city, reporting on what I've done to deal with them to date, and describing what I plan to do going forward. Issues like making Pasadena financially strong, supporting the PUSD, safeguarding the environment, protecting the quality of life in our neighborhoods, reducing crime, and now improving police oversight. My opponent has adopted a very different strategy in this campaign, and you heard it in his introductory comments. He's criticized planning as an abstract exercise rather than recognizing that it embodies the will of the people informing the future of our city. I'm proud to have arrived here 40 years ago to convert old Pasadena into a beating commercial center. He's spoken in vague terms about advocating change after serving 20 years on the city council. He's talked about his listening skills, but seemingly only to the loudest, most influential segments of the community. He wants Pasadena to tie itself to other San Gabriel Valley communities in an organization that has consistently not shared our values on housing and transportation issues. Lastly, he has launched a smear campaign in TV ads and print, misleading the public into thinking that I abandoned my responsibilities while on an official sister city trip early in March, grossly misrepresenting what really happened and ignoring the intervening seven months. I believe that this election cannot be bought. I believe the voters will focus on actual performance ideas and truth. I hope that you will agree and allow you to continue my service as your mayor. Okay, that's time. Boy, that guy's right on time, isn't he? <laughs> uh, wow. Um, okay, we will move right into the questions. And our first question will be asked by Bradley Vermont. And uh, we will start with you, Mr. Gordo. Bradley? Gentlemen, let's start with a seemingly simple question. 
How do you define the role of Pasadena's mayor? Mr. Gorda? Well, you know, I, I believe the role of the mayor is, as, as I said, to have his or her finger on the pulse of every part of this city, uh, to work with the elected members of the city council, to work with residents, uh, to build consensus, and then do what I've done for over 20 years. Uh, resolve complex neighborhood issues, resolve citywide issues, um, take action uh, on behalf of residents, uh, you know, and, and, you know, no one vote on the city council is going to get anything done. Uh, my opponent uh, um, campaigns on having, uh, and I'm taking credit for a lot of the actions, many of which he wasn't even there for, uh, inclusionary housing, the 710 freeway, um, uh, strengthening the city's finances before the recession, my opponent joined the city council in 2009. All of those things had already occurred. When he did join the city council, um, then he refused to vote no on the 710 tunnel and now takes credit for killing it. Uh, and so the role of the mayor is to pay close attention to the residents of this city and pay attention and, and uh, represent the residents of this city. Planning is important. Uh, it's a guidepost, uh, but it shouldn't freeze us in time. Uh, as we begin to see the city evolve, it's the role of the mayor and the city council to listen carefully to residents. Uh, when that plan comes off its off paper uh, and begins to evolve and change the, fa the fabric of our city, it's our role uh, as mayor and a city, as a city council to uh, adjust the plan. Um, you know, I'm not a planner, I'm not a developer, I'm not married to a plan or a development. I represent people, not plans. Uh, and I think that's what's missing right now. Um, our incumbent is not hearing, not listening to the people of the city who are saying, we need to do things differently. The people of this city, as I said at the beginning of this campaign, don't feel listened to and don't feel represented by the tone set at the top by our incumbent. That's time. Mr. Tornick, you can respond to the question. Thank you. Uh, I think the role of the mayor is to listen very attentively to what people have to say on various issues. Um, and there's nobody that spent more time listening to people in the city of Pasadena than I have, whether it's at community meetings, at public fora, uh, at um, nonprofit organizations when they meet and talk about issues that confront them. I am the most attentive mayor uh, in recent history. After listening to what the people have to say, you have to study the issue carefully. You have to be diligent in your preparation. Uh, be careful to understand the alternatives and what they'll mean to the city. And then bring it to the council and try and achieve consensus. Um, there have been suggestions that I'm not a consensus builder. And yet on the three most controversial issues that have come to Pasadena in recent memory, uh, the minimum wage measures I and J, the sales tax uh, measures, and police oversight, um, I think it's fair to, to suggest that I can claim significant credit for showing the leadership that led to unanimous votes on the city council on these controversial issues. So I'm attentive. I'm a consensus builder. Once we do that, the important thing is to provide the guidance to the city staff who actually implement the work. They do the work. The council sets the policies. The council provides oversight, but it's the staff that does the, that does the work. And I think it's absolutely critical to understand what it takes to do that work. And as someone who has been a department head, proudly been a department head in the city of Pasadena, as well as a commissioner and a city councilman, I think I, I bring the, a unique kind of experience in terms of understanding what it does to get the work done for the people of Pasadena. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gordo, you have one minute for rebuttal. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a reinvention of, uh, of history. We all know uh, Mr. Tornick's view on being mayor. And he told us in the last debate, he said, a very different answer than today. Many of you heard it. He said, the job of the mayor is to set the agenda and orchestrate the work of the staff. Mr. Tornick can deny it if he likes, but that's what he said. Um, orchestrate the work of the staff. That's not the job of the mayor. That's the job of the city manager. Uh, but that's the, that's the approach that he's employed, uh, not listening to dismissing even members of the city council. Uh, that, that was not consensus building, uh, at, even at the public safety committee. My colleague, Steve Madison and Tyrone Hampton, a long life, uh, lifelong resident of, 
the city told us what happened on oversight. Uh, they were dismissed. Um, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Tornick created a proposal that was business as usual that did not have independent oversight. It wasn't until I got to the city council and we vigorously opposed that uh, model that it changed and actually became independent. I'm sorry, that's time, Mr. Gordo. Um, Mr. Tornick, you have one minute rebuttal. Yeah, I think that uh, my esteemed colleague uh, can't really make up his mind about what mayors are supposed to do and not do. Sometimes he criticizes me for doing too much. Sometimes he criticizes me for doing too little. Uh, there's wordsmithing going on here in terms of oversight, guidance, and I mean, it, it, it's really all over the place. I think it's pretty clear that the mayor is elected citywide to, to try to have an overview that represents all the people of the city, and that's what I've attempted to do. I don't meddle with the uh, city manager. I didn't propose an ombudsman uh, over all the activities of the city manager. I recognize and value and understand clearly the role of the city manager and that of the elected officials. And I think I've tried to execute that effectively and I think I've demonstrated success. Maybe you can comment on orchestration. Hey, no, I, I'm sorry, that, that we're, going, we're moving on to the next question. And um, that will be uh, Mr. James Farr. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, this question is to uh, Mayor Tornick. Please explain your view on the relative importance of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments to Pasadena and, and in this campaign season. The uh, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments is something that I represented the city on for about eight years. I attended every meeting. I was deeply involved in their activities. I became increasingly disenchanted uh, with their positions on matters of substance to Pasadena. They were strongly supportive of the 710 freeway. They were resistant to the development of multifamily and affordable housing. Uh, they began to convert themselves from a planning agency to a construction agency, primarily to, to construct the interchange 57 and the 60 freeways. And it became clear to me that it was not necessarily in our best interest to continue our membership there. Uh, this has become, a, you know, our, my opponent has raised this as a sort of a central issue, suggesting that it weakens Pasadena to not be affiliated with a group of, of communities that have steadfastly uh, been in opposition to positions that Pasadena has tried to support. I feel that our interests are better served affiliating with the Arroyo Verdugo organization, which is a newer uh, collective organization that contains uh, Burbank, Glendale, South Pasadena, uh, and La Cañada, that's where our natural affinity is. And also the money for transportation has been moved from the San Gabriel Valley Cog to Arroyo Verdugo. So for a bunch of reasons, I brought this to the city council, the city council debated it. I suggested that if anyone was really determined to remain in the Cog and they raised their hand and volunteered to attend the meetings, uh, that they would be welcome to do that. None of them did that and the city council voted to uh, terminate our relationship with the COG. My opponent has suggested that we need to take on the, the mantle of leadership uh, of uh, the San Gabriel Valley communities. I suggest that that might be something that he might camp campaign on for some other office. I'm not running for mayor of the San Gabriel Valley or state representative. Uh, I'm running for mayor of Pasadena and I think our interests are not served by the COG. Mr. Gordo. So oh, first, let me uh, let me touch on the San Gabriel Council uh, Valley Council of Governments. Thirty-one cities uh, in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, twenty-nine uh, twenty-nine school districts, three members of the Board of Supervisors, three water districts, all working together. Bradley, Vermont, you wrote the story recently where Margaret Clark said exactly the opposite that Mayor Tornick is saying right now. She said we're working on transportation, we're working together on homelessness, we're working together on uh, water quality. We're pushing back on local control. Bradley Vermont and the Pasadena Star News wrote that story, Mr. Tornick. You're misleading people. They are exactly working on those comments. And it was a few weeks ago that the president of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments told us. 31 cities, but only 30 cities represented. Pasadena is missing on those regional homeless efforts. Pasadena is missing on those housing efforts, transportation. It, it makes no sense to say we're gonna work with three neighbors to the east of us and turn our back and call irrelevant 
Say it like you did, Mr. Tornick. You said they, those cities are smaller than us and they're not relevant. I objected on that vote. Uh, I said no. Uh, in terms, you know, the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments is not going to solve all of our problems, uh, but it's a tool. And why would we call an important tool, regional partners, 2.4 million people working together, irrelevant and offensive and dismiss them? It's part of the dismissiveness that includes our neighbors and our residents that you have employed. Um, they're not irrelevant. They're our neighbors and they want to work with us and we should be working with them. And yes, Pasadena, it has historically been a leader and we set the example. You weren't around when we adopted inclusionary housing in 2006 and, as a city and, and smaller cities like Los Angeles followed our lead because they were paying attention to us. People watch us. We should be working with our neighbors. In terms of running for some other office, I've been here for 20 years, Mr. Mayor. It was you who suggested to me when you were elected that I should run for supervisor and you would support me. I told you I like it right here in Pasadena. That, that, that's time. That's time. Um, Mr. Tornick, you have one minute for rebuttal. I think it would be useful to be well informed rather than just use general language. Um, Mr. Gordo's never attended a meeting of the San Gabriel Valley COG, to my knowledge. I attended for eight years. I know what actually happens there. The notion that we should, should provide leadership to communities that, ha that, are in, that have taken positions directly in opposition to what Pasadena's issues have been repeatedly, that has taken its housing responsibilities and assigned it to yet another organization called the, uh, the San Gabriel Valley Regional Housing Trust, not taking it on as a COG matter. Uh, the fact that our transportation dollars come through the Arroyo Verdugo rather than San Gabriel Valley and that they are now a construction oriented organization determined to build more highways betrays the fact that there hasn't been careful research. These are the kind of nice sounding ideas that are not backed up by facts and don't serve the people well. Uh, Mr. Gordo, you have one minute. Oh. Now, so, now, so, now you do, so now you do admit that they're working on housing. The housing trust is created by the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments and lives at the San Gabriel Council Valley Council of Governments and they're working together to leverage local resources. Uh, to build more affordable housing in the region. Arcadia is a member. Um, Monrovia is a member. Pasadena is not. Uh, we're not working together when we could be leveraging our local resources to bring desperately needed affordable housing. Uh, and at the housing forum, you did say they were smaller than us and not relevant. You dismissed them, dismiss people who, who, who are our neighbors and come and, and, and patronize our businesses um, and call them irrelevant. I reject that. Pasadena, and, and by the way, on the 710 freeway, you took us out of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments in 2017 or 2018. In 2015, the Council of Governments, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments had already taken away money for the 710 freeway and opposed it. Yeah. Two years later. Not true. It is that's very time. true. That, and easily that, that's time. It is very that's true. That's time. That's time. Let me make sure that you guys understand um, how this, how this is working, because I, I can see maybe there may be some confusion. Each of you are able to ask, answer the question, you have two minutes, and then after the last person answers, each person would have one minute for a rebuttal, both sides. Uh, so we're gonna move on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm not clear, Martin. Is there a rebuttal and then another rebuttal, or is it just one rebuttal after the second answer? Yeah, it, no, is each of you has one minute for a rebuttal. So you can answer the question, he can answer the question, you can have a rebuttal for one minute, he can have a rebuttal for one minute. And when it's the other way, it's, it's the same thing. So there's always, each of you gets to answer the question, each of you gets one rebuttal, but just one. I know you like six, but just one. I'm sorry, we got it. <laughs> that didn't happen on the first question, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay we're, we're gonna move on. And uh, for the next question, I believe that's you, uh, Bradley. All right, guys, um, what, what actionable measures can the city take to increase investment in historically disadvantaged communities? I think that's to Mayor Tornick. No, I, 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 uh, that's to, to Mr. Gorda. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, he, what, what actionable measures can the city take to increase investment in historically disadvantaged communities? Well, you know, so, so 
measures to take to increase um, investment. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to be proactive and I've done it for 20 years. Uh, you know, when, when uh, people think it's a function of just uh, routine business, when we replaced, uh, when we replaced, for example, burned out apartment buildings with affordable housing, they think it just happened when we replaced uh, liquor stores that needed to be replaced uh, because they were bad operators uh, with affordable housing. Uh, we took action uh, and we should continue to take actions like that. Uh, I asked the city staff at the time, um, you know, follow those properties that need investment uh, in our city, um, in disadvantaged communities. And when they go up for sale, let me know. Uh, and when they did go up for sale, I went to people like Joel Bryant, uh, who lives in our neighborhood. And I said, Joel, I need you to tie that property up because we're going to reinvest in not only in affordable housing at that liquor store, uh, but I'm going to ask the city council to also make it a neighborhood improvement project. And we replace liquor stores and apartment buildings uh, in our city. So the action, the measurable action uh, that I've taken uh, in, in my district, in District 5, over many years is just that, um, measurable. And we should continue to do it and do it in every part of the city. There are, there are properties needing and neighbor properties needing investment and neighborhoods needing improvement in every part of the city, uh, and we should engage um, local people who are interested in investing uh, and ask them to do so uh, in a responsible way by creating more affordable housing and ridding our city of blight. And then, and then of course, there are the uh, there's always the work of the staff uh, going to trade shows, trying to attract people to. Uh, to Old Pasadena, to South Lake, to North Lake, to every part of our city, uh, Fair Oaks, uh, Lincoln. But the real change is going to come one lot at a time. That's what I've proven over time, and that's what I continue to continue. To, that's what I plan to continue to do. That's time, Mr. Tornick. Thank you. I you know I think it's great to um, to rid neighborhoods of uh, inappropriate liquor stores and and burn down buildings. I. I, I congratulate everyone associated with that, including uh, my esteemed colleague. Uh, but that's not the scale that, that uh, I appreciate the one lot at a time strategy, but there has to be a sort of a bigger vision. And I think that the, the very sort of uh, activity that, that um, my opponent has decried as a planning exercise is exactly what we're talking about. The way that you achieve the kind of scaled up change that needs to be accomplished is through planning and through the kinds of uh, involving people and understanding what their future needs to look like, how it can be changed. Uh, and those are the activities that I've been involved in for a long time. Uh, I, I participated with Pasadena Neighborhood Housing Services for more than 20 years as a volunteer. And that was an effort to, to make the sort of lot by lot uh, uh, achievements that need to happen to turn neighborhood around. But the way that you achieve larger scale improvement is to make institutional change. So that for example, when PCC put a, a branch at Muir High School, um, that made a, that, that's a statement in terms of investment in the future for that, that part of the community. When, the, um, when employers are, in, are in, attracted to Pasadena that are the kinds of employers that we've been working to attract, those in education, those in, in, in hospitality and medical activities, those are employers that provide the kind of, of uh, employment ladders and opportunities to all segments of the community so that we can provide income for people in all parts of the city. Uh, when we develop uh, affordable housing at a large scale in neighborhoods, we can make a difference in terms of what happens in communities. So I think that we need to operate both at the lot by lot level and also at the citywide systemic level to have a vision for the future about what kinds of investments can be attracted to Pasadena uh, to make a difference in people's lives. That's time. Um, Mr. Mr. Gordo, you have one minute for rebuttal. You know, you know um, my, my, my opponent takes credit, for example, for old Pasadena as the planning director when he was only planning director for two, maybe three years in Pasadena. But I actually worked in old Pasadena when old Pasadena uh, was boarded up when there was one or two restaurants there at the Rose City Diner. Uh, we didn't need to change the fabric of the city in order to bring investment into Old Pasadena. In fact, we protected the fabric of the city as we brought reinvestment to Old Pasadena. It is one lot at a time. 
Uh, it's not, you know, we're, we're not going to create change in large swaths without changing the fabric of this city. Uh, and people are concerned about that. I've listened to them. We all should listen to them. Um, and I remember working at Rose City Diner uh, when people were having the, the fights on, on uh, renovation. Um, and what we're seeing today in the planning documents that Mr. Tornick and the plans that he defends and the projects and developers he defends is a change in the fabric, completely opposite to what he said he was doing in Old Pasadena for two years. Okay, thank you. And uh, Terry, you have one minute. Yeah, thank you. I, I love talking about Old Pasadena because not only did I write, did I get hired specifically to work on Old Pasadena, I wrote the redevelopment plan, I developed the parking garage strategy, and then after I left the city, after the three years that, uh, that were referenced, I actually developed two properties at the corner of Fair Oaks in Colorado, the Dodsworth building and the building next door. Uh, so I put my money where my mouth was. I worked in, in private development. So I've seen what it actually takes. It's not a theoretical construct for me. It's something I've actually experienced in my life and know how it works. And the process needs to be sustained. It needs to be thoughtful. It needs to encourage public participation, but it can't just be responsive to people who come at the end of the game with the loudest voices and then say, oh no, I think our planning documents are inappropriate. We should throw them out. That's not the way that you, you take care of the city's future, whether it's in Northwest or in Old Pasadena or anywhere else in the city. Thank you, that's time. Uh, we need to move on to the next question. Don't I get a, another? No. no, you don't. You've already, you already, the first. You already. Oh, I see. I thought we went in a re rebuttal. No, no, no. There's no re rebuttals. Okay. One apiece. One apiece. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, uh, the next question is going to come from uh, you, James, and, and it starts with Terry, Terry Tornick. Mayor Tornick, how do you feel about Pasadena Police Department? handling of the fallout of the Anthony McLean shooting. This includes how the videos were released and what order they were released in, as well as how Black Lives Matter protesters were handled. I think that the, uh, the handling of the McLean shooting uh, is, a, is a sort of a no-win situation. Uh, I think when we get to the point in the process where there's been a shooting, um, there is no handling that will satisfy uh, everybody's interest. Everybody understands that. Um, I think you can, you can argue about the, the specifics of what videos released in what sequence, uh, whether they were accurate, whether they were too fuzzy, whether they were edited. Um, that's inevitable, and that's what, that's what winds up getting us involved in protracted litigation. What I know is that the police department and the city manager made an honest effort to get the videos available out as quickly as possible. Uh, they were immediately attacked. Part of the, you know, part of the issue with the, the videos is that, and, and I supported the body-worn cameras um, very aggressively when they were first introduced, because I felt it was in everybody's best interest. And, they, and the police officers agreed. Uh, but part of the problem is that this is not a Hollywood production. You don't have the kind of precision, multiple camera angles, absolute clarity, that people think that they can get when they're watching CSI. That's not the way the real world works. So no matter what the city does, no matter what it releases, it's gonna be a source of controversy and, uh, and claims that they're inaccurate. Now we have claims that the, the, the weapon that was recovered uh, after DNA testing uh, was planted. I mean, you know, there's no end to the conspiracy, conspiracy theories. I think the real issue needs to be, and the reason I worked so hard on police oversight the real issue needs to be to develop a level of trust between the city, the police department and the minority community so that they don't automatically assume the worst. Everybody doesn't assume the worst about everyone else. And we can begin to uh, trust each other on a level that when we do have a terrible incident, it won't automatically default to the, to the contrary positions and, and sense of conflict that we have now. Thank you. Victor? You know, the, the, the issue is trust. Uh, and transparency. Um, and while we may have done some things right, um, we also, I think, would not want to repeat some of the things that we did uh, in, in this specific incident. Um, and the example is, and the, and the example is this. Uh, we moved quickly to release the video, that's true. But then we edited a video. 
uh, and then and then uh, we didn't release all of the footage um, that should have been released um, as clearly as it was then uh, revealed to be. Uh, when I saw the the video, and I didn't see the whole video, I wasn't shown the whole video as others may have been uh, before its release. Uh, and I said to the city manager, "Where where's the?" We're, you know, and I too supported the uh, the um, body worn cameras. But I said to the city manager, "Where's the footage of of this gentleman running behind the car? Uh, where's the footage of the police officer approaching the car?" Um, I was not shown that, uh, and later on, uh, it did become public, but it did not become public in the way that it should have been. We should not have edited that video, uh, and I think that's a, that's a learning. Uh, that uh, that's something we have to learn from. Uh, in terms of um, some of the uh, some of the handling of not just this case but uh, the evidence in this case, um, I do think we have a responsibility to be very transparent. Uh, I do think we have a responsibility to give the facts to the people uh, as we know them, so long as it doesn't compromise the investigation, um, and that's going to be the difficult challenge. Uh, but, you know, I think from the very beginning, the, our failure to release the information uh, in the way that it should have been released uh, caused a lot of uh, distrust uh, and caused some people to question the handling of this matter. Uh, and we need to do better than that going forward. Um, Mr. Torney, you have one minute rebuttal. Don't have any. Mr. You still have one minute rebuttal, Victor, if you, if you want it. If either would like to answer the question of handling of Black Lives Matter protesters, um, that was the third part of that question. Um, I'm I, sorry, I I'll, if I can, Martin, I'll use it for that. I, I neglected to respond to that. I think that the, uh, the handling of the protests, um, I attended some of those demonstrations. I think the police department was very measured in its management of that. Uh, there's been criticism of the way the, uh, uh, the protests were handled um, uh, when there was an attempt to occupy the area near City Hall. I think uh, allowing people to occupy the Civic Center was not appropriate, and I think the police department handled that well. Um, I had an experience with the protesters uh, in front of my house. They were very respectful. Uh, I had a good dialogue with them, and I, I told them exactly what what I, my reactions were and listened carefully to what their complaints were. I think Pasadena can be proud in general terms of how the, uh, as, as compared and contrasted with other communities, how demonstrations were handled, how people conducted themselves and how the police department responded to those demonstrations. Thank you. you have I, think, I, I think the, the people expressing the first amendment view uh, and the police department handled it well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, before uh, the uh, protesters, uh, two days before they, they visited uh, Mr. Mayor Tornick's home, they came to my home and I was having dinner with my family and, I, and I'd been told, don't engage. Um, and all of a sudden people are standing outside my door, about a hundred people running into my backyard, pounding on the door. Uh, and Jasmine is uh, yelling, uh, Victor Gordo, we know you're in there. Uh, and I collected myself. It was startling. I'm much more sure-footed about it now than I was then. Uh, but I went outside and I said, Jasmine, what are you doing? And she said, Victor, we just want to talk. And so I walked out there and talked to him for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then she said, will you march with us to the police station? And I said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to do that, but I'll walk with you as we finish this conversation for a few blocks. And I did that. I think that's the kind of mayor we need, not someone who says, stay off my lawn, don't come over here. Uh, that's, that's time. That's time. Okay, we're, we're going to move on to the next question. And uh, that's going to be you, Bradley. Uh, and that's for starting with Victor. Uh, in Pasadena, we've heard the tale of two cities, those who can live here and those who cannot. Residents have called for measures like rent control, vacancy taxes, or even asking the city to buy up uh, apartment buildings when they come on the market. As mayor, will you support any of these alternatives or do you have any of your own suggestions? Bradley, you, you again broke up a little bit. Uh, I, I can repeat the question for you. Please. 
we, we, in Pasadena, we've heard the tale of two cities, those who can live here and those who cannot. Residents have called for measures like rent control, vacancy taxes, or even buying up apartment buildings when they come on the market. As mayor, will you support any of these alternatives or do you have your own suggestion? Yeah, you know, on, on the issue of uh, buy, buying up uh, um, old apartment houses, absolutely, that's precisely what uh, we've done. Um, and we should continue to do more of that. Um, you know, Hudson Oaks is an example of that in my district, a burned out apartment building that was des in desperate need of, of uh, investment. Um, the, the former nursery on Orange Grove uh, that, that is now Orange Grove Gardens uh, was, a, was a property that needed desperate investment, and we did that. Um, the, the property on Fair Oaks, the Heritage Housing Project, Fair Oaks in Peoria, was a combination, it was a, it just a, a property that seriously needed investment uh, that had a, a lot of beautiful old homes, uh, but could also uh, use some uh, new investment in terms of new, new, new housing. And we did that. We renovated houses. Uh, we moved them around, created a, a meeting neighborhood uh, at uh, Peoria and Fair Oaks. And you all drive by it regularly and see it. And then we put in a, a affordable, uh, all those homes, by the way, were affordable. Uh, all of those homes um, were renovated to make, be made beautiful again. Uh, old 1910 and 1920 bungalows. Um, and we should continue to do more of that. Uh, in terms of uh, rent control, the, the, the state has adopted statewide rent control and we'll monitor it. You know, I'm concerned that rent control becomes the answer to, uh, to you know, the, the, the people believe it's a magic bullet and they believe it's the answer to all our problems. You know, Santa Monica has rent control. Los Angeles has rent control. San Francisco has rent control. And yet they're some of the most expensive markets in the country. I'll be interested to hear from uh, Mayor Tornick why, you know, the, the California uh, Apartment Owners Association recently um, opened up an independent expenditure to spend $35,000 on his campaign. That's time for you. Um, Mr. Tornick. Well, as to that last point, I don't know anything about that. That's the first, literally the first time I'd ever heard that. I'm delighted that somebody will be spending some money on my campaign because I can't compete with my opponent. Uh, so I don't know anything about the apartment owners. I do know that uh, we are in agreement about rent control as not being the answer to the housing crisis in Pasadena or in, in, the, in the region or in the state. Uh, the city has to be innovative and the, the city has a history of trying to be innovative. Um, we're now working on the property, the city owned property across from City Hall, as you know, to create housing. We've partnered with other agencies like the $2 million that the city has agreed to invest in the Salvation Army project on Mentor and Walnut in, in Council Member Gordo's district. Uh, we are, um, uh, we should be working harder and, at, and with some more urgency with the churches who have expressed an interest in using their surplus land uh, to create affordable housing resources and also help support their, their survival. Uh, I've been actively trying to work with our friends at the PUSD in terms of using some of their surplus property, particularly for workforce housing that might sustain teachers, but also affordable housing in general. And of course we have the, uh, the, the motel conversion ordinance, uh, which I suggested for Pasadena after seeing it implemented successfully at a volunteer um, organization that I worked on called Link Housing which did a, a motel conversion project in Huntington Park, which was a huge success. We haven't had that success in the initial uh, offerings in Pasadena, but I'm still optimistic that it's a good idea. So we have to be prepared to be flexible and alert and, and make progress with regard to affordable housing in all of these areas. I have been a champion for affordable housing for all of my, nearly all of my adult life. Um, and I am, am, will continue to do that as mayor, I'm, I'm proud of Pasadena's record, but I know that we have a long, long way to travel. Okay, yes, you, uh, we have one minute, one minute. So, so uh, again, you know, Pasadena is not going to construct its way out of the affordable housing crisis. It's a, re, it's a, it's a city, regional and national issue. And it, go, it gets back to working with our partners. Uh, and Mr. Tornick has now uh, advised uh, us and admitted that the San Gabriel Council Valley of Governments is working on housing and we should support those efforts and be a part of it. 
Um, uh, you know, I'm proud of, of our city's effort on affordable housing. Uh, and I think we can be an example for others uh, as we have in the past. I, may, I gave you the example of the inclusionary housing ordinance when it was tough, when developers said, if you, if you mandate 15% of all development to be affordable, uh, development's going to go away in Pasadena. But again, we led and others followed. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the contribution, Mr. Tornick, from the Apartment Owners Association, did they in fact, did you ever meet with them? Because I said, no, I wasn't going to meet with them uh, when they called. Maybe, maybe that's why they went elsewhere. Okay, Mr. Mr. Tornick, you yeah, have one minute. The question is, yes, I absolutely met with them. I've met with virtually everyone because I, I'm a listener, contrary to what's been suggested. I want to hear what everybody's point of view is. I wanted to know why the apartment house owners were raising their rents so quickly. It was a two-way meeting. Um, I, you know, I haven't been endorsed by them, but I, I, and I don't know about any expenditure, but again, I would love to have some money from anybody. If there's anybody out there that wants to make a contribution, please send it to my, my uh, website because I, I can use it I'm, to try to be competitive. With regard to the COG, I mean, beating that horse is, is just outrageous. That is an organization comprised of members who have been so recalcitrant and doing anything on multifamily or affordable housing that it's really laughable. They contract with Union Station because they don't know how to do anything. Bill Wong is a consultant to them and does provide leadership and assistance to them. And the likelihood of us tying ourselves to them and making progress and, and that benefiting us is, is so absurd that it really just doesn't bear further conversation. It's a tool. <laughs> okay, that's time. And that's time. Thank you both. That was a lively discussion there. Uh, we we'll need to move to the, the yeah, we will need to move to the next question. And and that will be uh, you, uh, Mr. Farr. Uh, and the uh, first responder will be Terry Tornick. Mayor Tornick, how do you feel about the city staff's performance over the past five years? Has the city been run the way you'd like to see? Yes, um, I think the city staff is extraordinary. Um, I may, again, I may have a bias because I was a city staff person, uh, but I, that's a long time ago, long ago and far away. Um, but I think that we have, we have over 2000 city employees and I'm sure that there are some that are not doing a great job. But I think for the most part, my experience with city staff is that they are, they, they're loyal, uh, they're professional, they are caring, they're very much committed to, uh, to the future of our city, uh, and they really are extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary public servants. And, and that phrase, public servant, is not something that I use uh, lightly. Now, that's not to say that there, you know, there, there, there can't be improvements and that, that we don't uh, stub our toe. We have, I mean, I, and I know that because I'm the guy that gets the emails uh, from people who are not satisfied with the performance of the city staff. Um, I get the, I get the, uh, the emails about the, uh, the, the citizen service, you know, the complaint center, the, the, the app that people use now, a lot of people use, uh, that they're not getting the kind of response that they should be getting. I get the, the calls from, from uh, people who have are trying to, to uh, build out space in buildings and, and have had their plan stuck in plan check for multiple weeks and they're trying to get people back to work and are frustrated by that. So I'm not claiming that, uh, that Pasadena uh, is a miracle place where everybody does their job perfectly, but I have had the opportunity to work in a lot of cities. I've developed projects and, and managed properties in a variety of cities. I've lived elsewhere. Uh, around the country and have a tremendous, I was a consultant that worked with a variety of cities. And I can say without reservation that Pasadena has one of the most competent, devoted, loyal and effective uh, professional staffs in, in any city that I've ever seen. Mr. Gordo. And Mr. Mr. Tornick uh, has seen quite a few cities, uh, you know, beginning with the first city he ran for office and was elected to. Uh, and was planning director for uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, uh, when you were first elected, Mr. Tornick, that's that's the first city uh, you ran for office at and served as planning director. You know, I, 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 I and then came to Pasadena, worked for two years and then went off to become a developer. Um, and, you know, I, l let me say this in terms of our city staff. Um, our city staff is very dedicated 
and I and I believe that's why I have their support uh, because they know that I believe in the work of civil servants. But you know, at the moment, I believe that the people who are working for us and are very dedicated to us feel orchestrated. That's not my word. That's Mayor Tornick's word. That's what he said, orchestration. Uh, and I believe that uh, they're struggling to do their job because they feel put upon um, by the mayor of this city who believes um, and really should uh, consider looking at the position of city manager if the orchestration is what he's looking for. Um, but, you know, to, but I'm concerned about the performance uh, of all of the employees in our city, not the majority, uh, but some. And I'm concerned that, you know, it's not necessarily or entirely their fault. I, I'm concerned that they're not being allowed to do their job. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, more city managers. Uh, I've worked with police chiefs. I've worked with more city employees, more department heads, um, more police officers, more city employees than Mayor Tornick has. And I know when something is wrong. And I believe that the people of Pasadena and the people who work for the city of Pasadena recognize that too. Mr. Tornick, you have one minute for rebuttal. Well, thank you for, uh, for speaking to my record as planning director and city councilman in Springfield, Mass. Uh, uh, every 30 years or so, I get a, a yearning to run for political office and you know that's, that's been my experience. I value my experience elsewhere and I also value my experience as a developer and I think it contributes to my effectiveness in terms of understanding what it takes to, to really make a city successful. The inference that somehow uh, I'm meddling uh, in the way the, the city uh, staff is able to do their job couldn't be further from the truth. And unlike my opponent, I have never launched intense and really almost personal attacks on the planning department in terms of their management of the cannabis activities, on the health department in terms of its management during the pandemic, of nursing homes. I mean, that is not the kind of supportive um, uh, activity that elected officials are typically seen doing. I know that the city is, staff is not perfect, but I don't meddle in their activities. I don't even contact staff people without going through the city manager. So I'm not confused about the various roles. Mr. Gordo, you have one minute. Well, my reference to Springfield, Massachusetts, Mr. Tornick, is simply in response to your comment that maybe I'm running for a different office. Uh, I've been in Pasadena my entire life, serving the people of Pasadena. I like it here in Pasadena. Uh, my commitment is to the people of Pasadena. Um, in terms of uh, uh, being critical of the planning department involving cannabis, uh, or being uh, or, or demanding that our health department um, be more responsive and more uh, hands-on uh, in the time of crisis. That's our job. We're there to provide oversight. I didn't do it in private. I didn't run off and develop a proposal like, as you did with John Kennedy on police oversight and something your living room or his living room outside of the public eye. My criticism and my demands that we do things better both with both cannabis and in response to crisis was in public. And that's our job to provide oversight and demand that the people of this city have the best service possible. It's time. That's and we're gonna, move to, we're, we're gonna move to the next question. And that's with uh, Bradley. And uh, the first responder will be uh, Victor Gordo. Mr. Gordo, this is a two part question. How successful do you believe Pasadena was in its response to the pandemic? And do you see any areas with clear faults or clear successes? Yes. Um, I think uh, our initial response uh, was not as swift as it could have been. Um, you know, Mayor Tornick was cautioned uh, for weeks not to uh, take a trip overseas. Um, and that was not the time to do it. Uh, the mayor of of, uh, of our sister city asked to, for the trip to be to be uh, postponed. Uh, mayor Tornick's response uh, in writing uh, was, "We will miss him," and you know that's that's in the record. Uh, and so, as a result, in, in large part, we were slow. We didn't put. We, uh, Vice Mayor Hampton was calling for meetings, and I was supporting him. My colleagues were calling for meetings, and I was supporting them. Uh, we didn't meet until the 17th of March. 
Uh, and then, then when Mayor Tornick returned, he proceeded to allow the cancellation of meetings. As I was saying, let's, we need to meet, not for the purpose of meeting, but for the purpose of doing exactly what he said, providing oversight and direction uh, to, to our health department. Uh, you know, people were dying. Uh, people were scared. People were concerned about the economic impact and we were canceling meetings. And when I said, Mayor Tornick, we cannot keep canceling meetings. His response was, what difference will it make? Well, now we see the difference that it's made. Uh, now we see that, you know, businesses did struggle to get back up. Now we see that skilled nursing facilities struggled um, to have PPE and to have appropriate direction. Uh, now we see the difference that it made. Uh, finally, we've gotten control uh, in our skilled nursing facilities. Could we have done it sooner if we'd been more critical exercising our oversight instead of canceling meetings, questioning what difference it would make? I believe so. But our health department, having said that, uh, worked very hard. Our planning staff, once we were allowed to meet, um, worked very hard to, uh, to uh, put uh, uh, guidelines in place. Um, but, but we led that effort at the Economic Te and Technology Committee. The, the committee that I chair. Martin, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Tornick. You have uh, one one minute to uh, rebut. Two minutes. I'm oh, I'm sorry, you didn't get the answer yet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have turned off my mic. I got my own self confused, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think that there continues to be um, a conflation or a confusion between uh, number of meetings and getting work done. And I think that the, this, this refrain that says that we should have had more meetings, we could have mobilized more quickly um, is an exact um, reversal of, of the reality. We, have a, we had a situation where the staff was having difficulty getting its arms around um, critical responsibilities that it had to meet. I was engaged with the city manager on, a, on multiple times a day, as was council member Gordo, I'm told. And I think that the city manager was asking for an opportunity to get some, some things straight, to get procedures in place, to figure out who was gonna be coming into work, how the departments were gonna handle shifts, how the people at Water and Power were going to be organizing themselves so that they had redundant and separate teams uh, so that nobody got infected. There was an enormous amount of confusion and difficulty internally within the city staff trying to organize themselves. And at the same time, while it may be gratifying on the part of certain elected officials to be able to have meetings and ask questions and, and spend six or eight hours uh, questioning the staff about what they're trying to accomplish, the preparation for that meeting, the meeting itself, and even organizing the meeting electronically. I mean, we take Zoom for, for granted now, but at the time, even mastering the ability to conduct a meeting was a challenge for, for the IT staff. Devoting the resources and the time to having multiple and continuous meetings, in my judgment, and more importantly, in the, in the judgment of the city manager, was not the way to do it. And so I was really being cooperative in terms of, of the what the city manager and the staff department heads were requesting, not because I'm adverse to having meetings, I'll meet all the time. I mean, I'm the, I'm the meetingest guy in Pasadena, but I think that conflating the idea of, of having infrequent meetings and effectiveness by the city staff is not a fair judgment and it's inaccurate. That's time. Uh, Mr. Gordo, it's you have one minute for rebuttal. Uh, it, it's absolutely untrue. Uh, it was negligent to not have meetings. And let me give you an example. You didn't make it to the March 17th meeting. Mr. Kennedy did. Uh, I was present. And at that March 17th meeting, this is what happened. The first meeting we were able to hold. We approved food uh, for people who might need it. We demanded that uh, children at schools be served lunch. So it's ch food for children and seniors. Uh, we demanded that special attention be paid to the most vulnerable populations, including the skilled nursing facilities. That's where the discussion started. And we should have continued those discussions instead of canceling meetings. Uh, we met maybe three or four times between March and, eight, and the last days of April, the beginning of, uh, of May, three or four times after I wrote an op-ed piece demanding we get back to work, Mayor Tornick, we met more often that following week than we had in all of since February 24th. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of conducting meetings, remember the first meeting that the council 
that the city that's manager- time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Gordo, that's was time. To approve two cannabis permits. That's where I got incensed. That's, we didn't have time that's to time, do- That's talk time, COVID, Mr. Gordo. But they were talking- That's, not, that's time, Mr. Gordo. Uh, uh, you have one minute, uh, Mr. Tornick. Look, the meeting, the, the first uh, meeting that's described in March was a meeting that, that uh, I had cleared the agenda and discussed every item with the city manager in advance. Uh, I did that remotely. I mean, as, as we've established here today, we're not in the same room meeting, but I was a participant in the run up to that meeting. I then had to get the delegation on a flight, so I wasn't able to actually participate in that meeting. The only meeting I've missed in five years as mayor. Uh, so I, I think that the, there's a continued assumption that somehow oversight is what the council is supposed to be doing, except that it would, when it should be doing something more. Um, and then, but when I suggest that it should be doing something more, that's orchestration and it's not okay. So I think it's, it's really important to sort of define in everybody's mind what the council and the elected officials should be doing and should not be doing and how they should be doing it. But I think that the proof of the, of the pudding is in the performance over the past seven months. And I think the city of Pasadena has been served very well. Thank you, that, that was time. Uh, I'm hate to tell you guys this, but our time has uh, just about run out uh, for, for today. Um, what I would like to do is make sure that you each have time for your closing statement, which will be one minute uh, and we will start with Mr. Gordo. You know, I, I, I humbly say to you that I am the, the most dedicated, best qualified, um, and most experienced candidate to be mayor of our city. Uh, I have a record of accomplishment uh, that, uh, that uh, is, is well known to people. Um, and I, I have a record of bringing people together, listening to residents to solve difficult problems. Uh, and I can intend to continue to do that. Uh, for 20 years, I've done that. Um, in closed session, in open session, uh, I've represented people. And that's what this campaign is about. The representation of residents, not projects, not plans, not developers, not cannabis companies, people. Uh, and that's what I intend to do. And I humbly request uh, your support to be the next mayor of this city. And I commit to all of you that I'm going to earn your, your support and I'm going to earn uh, your vote. Uh, thank you very much for your consideration. Uh, and I look forward to representing all of the people of Pasadena. Thank, thank you, Councilman uh, Gordo. Um, now, uh, Mayor Tornick. Thank you, Martin, and thank you to everyone who's participated. Um, public service in Pasadena means having to grapple with many of the issues confronting much larger cities, but at a scale where you can actually make a difference. I'm grateful to have had that opportunity as your mayor. We've made important strides in reducing homelessness, strengthening our finances, developing police oversight, but there's much, much more to do. I love Pasadena. My family has lived here for nearly 40 years. My kids have grown up here and now we have grandchildren attending Pasadena public schools. The city's provided a wonderful home for my family. I hope that my record of performance, my listening to the community and my complete commitment to Pasadena's future have earned me your support. Please let performance, ideas and truth guide your choice, not spending and smears. I hope to have the opportunity to continue to work full time for you and for the city of Pasadena. Final note, Please vote yes on measures O and P, and please get a flu shot. <laughs> that, that's time for you, Mr. Tarn. I got a flu shot, that thing hurt. Right. Um, we're, we're, we're right at the end here, and uh, we're about to close the debate. Um, I do have a question for the candidates. We had a few really good questions left here. I'm wondering if I could get a commitment from you, you both, that uh, if we uh, submit those questions to you in writing, that you would respond in writing. Uh, within the next few days and we will publish uh, your responses. So we hope that both of you would uh, uh, commit to doing that. And I see you, um, uh, Terry say yes and Victor, sure. you both said yes. So that, that's wonderful. This, this ends our- Limit the number. <laughs> a small number, it's only, only a couple. Uh, it's only, it's only a, a couple of more, not, not a thousand, <laughs> 10, <laughs> just 10 more. No, uh, thank you so much. This has been a great debate. Um, I want to thank you, 
uh, Councilman Gordo, and thank you, Mayor Tornay, for being here with us. Also, I want to thank Bradley Vermont and James Farr. Uh, you did a wonderful job today. Good. We could have done it without you. Also, thank you, Caroline. Uh, without you, this could not have happened. The timer is so very important uh, to keep me on track. And Tom, you back there sticking me, telling me, get it on time, get it on time. That, that always helps me, you know, maybe not. Um, so thank you very much, you guys, for being here today. Uh, this was a great debate. Uh, it's not over yet. Uh, the one, one thing I'd have to tell you people out there, get out and vote. No. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you on the other side. Go Dodgers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.